This is an audiovisual presentation for the non-medical prescribing level 7 course. Introducing David Wilkinson, a 76-year-old male patient. I've chosen a fictitious name for the purpose of maintaining confidentiality. David presented to his GP, complaining of overnight onset of pain to his left big toe. Relevant past medical history, medication and allergies are outlined on this slide. The importance of communication in obtaining good health outcomes is well known. I used the Calgary Cambridge model to assist me in providing a framework for gaining all the relevant data, building report and deciding on, on clinical management, which ensured I did not miss any important aspect during the consultation. This was David's third time with a similar presentation in the past 12 months. He was booked into my clinic to review his symptoms over the phone after he was prescribed naproxen by his GP, but reported having recur recurring symptoms soon after completing the course of NSAID. I, de I decided to bring him in for a face-to-face -face consultation alongside my practice educator. Relevant initial clinical findings are shown on the slide. Differential diagnosis. Being diabetic at, and with cardiovascular comorbidities, septic arthritis was considered in this patient. I excluded this on the basis that his blood tests came back with the normal white blood cell count, as well as the inflammatory markers, ESR and CRP. David had no temperature, felt well systemically and spoke in full sentences. There was also no evidence of any recent infection, surgical procedure or breaks in the skin. Inflammatory arthritis was excluded in a similar fashion. Although rheumatoid factor was not included in the blood test, all inflammatory markers were normal. The pattern of, of involvement was monoarticular and his pain was not any worse in the morning or with rest, which are typical features of, inf of inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid. This was sufficient clinical evidence to rule out the differential. Cellulitis was also considered. However, clinically there was no evidence of any recent damage to the skin or history of trauma. The latter is another differential that was quickly excluded. His most recent neurovascular diabetic foot assessment showed normal sensory status, so David would be reasonably aware if he caused any damage. Bursitis was also considered, as any irritation over a deformity has the potential to lead to the development of an adventitial bursa and get inflamed. But the rapid opposite of action and the fact that he denied any recent activity or trauma and was in bed at the time of onset of pain made the diagnosis unlikely. David suffers from peripheral vascular disease, so I considered ischemia as another cause of his pain. However, on further questioning, he had no symptoms of intermittent claudication, and clinically, he had palpable pedal pulses on both feet, and the skin had a reasonably healthy pink appearance to it. Also, the short course of naproxen that he previously took did temporarily reduce his pain, which wouldn't happen if this was a case of ischemic pain. Osteoarthritis was also excluded. Pain from osteoarthritis typically follows a gradual onset and gets worse with activity or pressure over the joint. In David's case, the onset of pain was sudden. It started when he was resting at home. He wasn't involved in any form of activity and wasn't wearing enclosed shoes at the time. Also, osteoarthritis does not typically present with acute pain, heat, swelling and erythema. Moreover, pain would improve with rest in the case of osteoarthritis, which wasn't the case in David's case. Lastly, pseudo-gout or calcium pyrophosphate deposition, CPPD for short, is a crystal-induced arthritis that mimics gout. This differential was excluded on the basis that blood tests revealed hyperuricemia, which is a feature of gout and not pseudo-gout. Typically, abnormal findings and risk factors for CPPD are outlined on this slide, neither of which were present in David's case. Pseudo-gout tends to affect medium and large joints, such as the knee, wrist, ankle and shoulder, and very rarely affects the big toe the way gout does, particularly small joints like the interphalangeals. There is only one documented case in the literature of pseudogout at this location, which highlights the unlikelihood of this condition in David's case. Definite diagnosis would require evidence of calcium pyrophosphate crystals under polarized light microscopy and chondrocalcinosis on x-ray diffraction or ultrasound, which is impractical and would delay treatment. However, this would be considered if David were unresponsive to treatment. Diagnosis. I reached the diagnosis of gout following a process of elimination of all differential diagnosis, which was underpinned by the history, examination and laboratory findings. To further support my clinical reasoning, his blood test was unremarkable apart from serum uric acid levels, which were significantly raised. The European League Against Rheumatism EULR, British Society for Rheumatology, American College of Rheumatology and NICE guidelines all recommend that evidence of monosodium urate crystals under polarized light microscopy remains the, remains the gold standard for diagnosis. However, this is often not practical in primary care and thus recommend that clinical diagnosis can be made based on the presence of hyperuricemia and certain clinical suggestive features outlined on this slide. These six clinical features have been derived from two key papers. The first is a prospective diagnostic study where patient variables were collected and compared against synovial fluid analysis to identify the presence of monosodium urate crystals. Janssen and colleagues in 2010 study was unique in that it developed its own clinical prediction model for the diagnosis of acute gout rather than a set of criteria for classification purposes. 
Not only that, but the authors developed three separate models and used only the one with the best metrological performance, demonstrating a high level of regard in their methodology. The model yielded a diagnostic rule that could discriminate patients against seven variables, namely the six signs and symptoms outlined on the slide and hyperuricemia. A further strength is its uh, large sample size, uh, which improves the overall generalizability of the findings. The study may be limited by the fact that the clinical variables were assessed by one of the authors and not the participating family physicians who enrolled the patients in the first place. So it is not known how much this would affect the inter-rate reliability in terms of assessment of variables. A further weakness is the introduction of selection bias by using monoarthritis as the inclusion criterion, which would raise the possibility of gout uh, among the studied patients. Similarly, because of the strict inclusion, the applicability of the findings may be limited to patients with monoarthritis and not to patients with oligo- and polyarticular gout arthritis. Particularly in the elderly, the prevalence of oligoarticular and polyarticular gout increases as the disease is allowed to progress if it remains undiagnosed. The study could be improved by widening the inclusion, regardless of whether the probability of gout is high or low. This would represent a more real-world scenario and improve the diagnostic predictive value of the variables. In the second study, Taylor and colleagues found 10 features that were highly associated with the presence of monosodium urate crystal gout, six of which include those already outlined. The strengths of the study are the large sample size and inclusion of a control group. Its main limitations arise from the population studied. Subjects were not a primary care population, and patients likely had a more severe disease than would be seen in primary care, and thus does not represent the full spectrum of clinical gout. The sample was also biased towards chronic disease by the inclusion of patients with persistent features. Nevertheless, the findings of both studies are relevant and applicable, and demonstrate that the clinical and laboratory features are sensitive and specific enough to rely on for the diagnosis of gout in David's case, without the need for advanced diagnostic tests, which would delay and ultimately compromise treatment. Prescribing decision. Having established a diagnosis of acute gout, guidelines recommend that the choice of drug should be based on the presence of contraindications and the patient's experience with previous treatments, and recommend treating with either cortisone and or an NSAID as first-line options. In a recent study comparing the effectiveness and safety of naproxen and low-dose colchicine, Roddy and colleagues found no significant difference in pain reduction between people with a gout flare randomized to either naproxen or low-dose colchicine, although naproxen appeared to provide faster pain relief and fewer side effects. Given that the average age of participants in the study was over 15 years younger than my case, and the fact that the authors failed to mention what medication patients were on, I feel the, this impacts on the generalizability of their findings. A further limitation was the use of a loading dose with naproxen, which could explain the faster onset of pain relief. Solomon and colleagues in 2016 compared new users of colchicine with an equal number of non-users and followed both groups for cardi cardiovascular events. The findings reveal that colchicine use is associated with 49% lower risk in the cardiovascular outcome and 73% reduction in all-cause mortality. A strength of their study is that both groups were matched for age and gender and adjusted for potential confounders. However, as an observational study, it is still limited by non-random assignment of patients to a given group. As such, it is also subject to greater bias in that cochicine may have been preferentially prescribed to patients more willing to use medications like statins or antihypertensive drugs. While a randomized study would help confirm the causal link between cochicine and a lower cardiovascular risk, what's clear is that it has no negative impact. Watson and colleagues compared the effects of varying degrees on renal impairment on cochicine pharmacokinetics. The study found that patients with mild moderate renal impairment do not show accumulation of cochicine, which is in line with BNF recommendations that state that dose reduction is not necessary for patients with mild or moderate renal impairment. However, this study was inherently weak by its small sample size and the fact that it was sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, which may negatively impact on the general generalizability of the findings as it's a source of conflict of interest and bias. Turkel Taub and colleagues in 2010 compared low-dose and high-dose colchicine and found that a low-dose regime maintained the same efficacy as high-dose colchicine but with a significantly better side effect profile that was comparable to that of placebo. Appraisal of the strengths and weaknesses of the study are outlined on the slide. In weighing up the benefits and risks and the anticipated response to treatment with colchicine against an alternative like naproxen, consideration was given to the patient-specific factors outlined on the slide as well as David's response to previous treatment. After appraising the evidence and considering the patient's GFR, given that renal excretion is not a major route of elimination of cochicine, its use in mild to moderate kidney disease was considered safe. David was not on any medication that was an inhibitor of peak glycoprotein or the cytochrome P450, and he didn't display any abnormalities in his blood count. David's previous response to naproxen did not have long-lasting benefits, as his symptoms quickly recurred. Furthermore, he was already on several medications, and after considering the alternatives and consulting the local formulary and guidelines, I did not feel an NSAID, even with a PPI, was the safest choice for him. The reasons for this are explained on this slide. Overall, cortisone was deemed to have the best safety profile for David. 
David made the autonomous decision to start on oral colchicine using the UK recommended low dose of 500 micrograms two to four times per day. Overall, this is a safe and cost-effective medication with few and mild side effects. Pharmacodynamics. The anti-inflammatory effects of colchicine is mainly related to inhibition of neutrophil activation and migration to inflamed tissue. Colchicine is effective in small doses. It has a narrow therapeutic window before the adverse effect of gastrointestinal upset develops. David was advised to withhold atorvastatin during the course of taking colchicine, as both are known to interact, and there have been reports of myopathy in patients given colchicine with atorvastatin. Diuretic-induced hyperuricemia is a well-established side effect, particularly with bendroflumethiazide. Therefore, we agreed to also stop his bendroflumethiazide tablets and book him for a blood pressure review. Pharmacokinetics. Please refer to slide 8 for an outline of the specific pharmacokinetic properties of colchicine. Legislation. Under the Medicines Act 1968, a written prescription is required for certain medicines called prescription-only medicines. Colchicine would be an example of this. As a medicinal product licensed for the treatment of acute gout, I have prescribed colchicine in accordance with its licensing agreement. This gives myself as a prescriber a layer of protection as the marketing authority holder would be liable for any adverse effects the medicine would cause. This protective mechanism wouldn't be in place if the medicine were used outside its marketing authorization. Podiatrists must only prescribe those medications which are relevant to the treatment of disorders affecting the foot, ankle and associated structures, which was appropriate in this case. Under the Healthcare and Associations Professions Order 2014, I must ensure that appropriate indemnity arrangements are in place. In terms of employment, I am in receipt of cover by virtue of the employer's vicarious liability, as well as through my respective recommended union, the Royal College of Podiatry, which offers indemnity arrangement as a benefit of membership. Holding a prescribing qualification does not automatically allow one to prescribe if the prescribing is done outside the terms and conditions of the employment contract, in which case the vicarious liability may no longer apply and the prescriber would lose protection from his employer. Upon completion of the course, I will check with my employer that prescribing practice is indeed stipulated as part of my job description and amended if not to reflect my prescribing duties. Legal implications. As a prospective NMP, I owe a duty of care to patients, which extends to all aspects of practice, including informed consent. In law, professional negligence would be judged on the balance of probabilities that I acted as a reasonable person would. Previously, the Bolan test in England was, the, was used to determine what should be disclosed. However, the Montgomery ruling in 2015 redefined the law around information sharing and informed consent and established a duty of care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative treatments. As part of my prescribing responsibilities, I considered that David did not demonstrate any cognitive impairment and had the capacity to understand the information he was given, retain it long enough to weigh up the information and communicate his decision. He was given sufficient information on the proposed treatment with Colchicine in a way that he understood and had him explain back to me what I just said to confirm his understanding. This enabled him to make an informed decision. Ethical considerations. The HCPC standard of conduct, performance and ethics are closely aligned with the four principles of biomedical ethics described by Beauchamp and Childress. To respect the principle of autonomy, when recommending treatment options, I made David aware of the potential risks, interactions and side effect profile of colchicine. I also wanted to ensure he was fully informed and gave him the opportunity to ask any further questions. David was given the autonomy to decide if he wanted to proceed with the treatment and I was respectful of his choice even if it hadn't been in line with my recommendations. The principles of non-maleficence and beneficence were already discussed in slides 6 and 7. It was important to fully assess David's medical history and the medications and consider this in my prescribing decision to establish a safe, efficacious treatment of choice. I was also mindful that, while beneficence was respected, the patient could still experience detrimental side effects. In terms of justice, David was treated without any form of discrimination and was given equal access to the benefits available. The rules of veracity, confidentiality, privacy and fidelity were also respected at all times. Professional Responsibility and CPD Evidence of competencies 1 to 6 of the RPS framework have already been discussed earlier in the assessment, diagnosis and prescribing decision slides, and competencies 7 to 10 in the legal, ethical and professional considerations slides. Please refer to the sli last slide for a summary. Safe prescribing decisions require vigilance and critical reflection, which is an ongoing process that I will carry over in my prescribing journey. In my new role as a prescriber, I will be accountable for my actions and I will have a duty to ensure my knowledge and skills are kept up to date through CPD activities, such as those shown on the next slide. In my role, I will be well supported by a network of prescribers that can guide me and support me. As part of my FCP role, I have to complete a portfolio of evidence, which will involve regular clinical supervision and participation in a journal club set up my, by my mentor. Upon receiving the independent prescribing annotation on my HCPC register, I will check with my employer to ensure any amendments to my contract and job description are done, and I will contact my local prescribing lead to show evidence of qualification and satisfy a good character check. And finally, my reference list.